Education is where healthcare begins. And so I'm delighted tonight to be talking about how we are thinking about educating uh, the doctors our communities need, our state needs, and our nation needs. These are my roles and disclaimers. I am an internist at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, where, as Dr. Navarro said, I was chief resident back in the 1980s. It was a very transformative experience for me to um, be in the midst of the San Francisco community right at the beginning and the early years of the HIV pandemic. And it instilled in me a commitment to community service and care for, um, and care for individuals who have been historically excluded or oppressed by institutions like medicine, the profession of medicine and healthcare. Uh, I am a professor of medicine, and these are my other um, titles that, that sometimes are associated with me. I want to tell you just a couple of other personal issues. One is um, I am a cisgendered white woman of substantial privilege, um, and I come to this work uh, with a true commitment to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to be cared for by a physician who is deeply committed to them. Um, the second is I'm the oldest of uh, uh, five children, the oldest of five siblings, and each one of my siblings has um, been injured by and almost um, killed by medical errors um, in the midst of their healthcare journeys throughout their lives. And so it's instilled in me also an understanding of how vulnerable anyone with illness is, regardless of whether they have a physician in the family, whether they come from a position of privilege or power. Um, and it's made me reflect many times on what it must be like for individuals who don't have connections within the healthcare system, who perhaps don't speak the same language, do not have the same culture, and do not feel the same trust in their healthcare providers as, as other, others of us might have been privileged to grow up with. And so it's with this um, background of experiences and, um, and identities that I present tonight. And I wanna also acknowledge, and I'm sure there are people in this audience who are um, deeply expert in many of the things that I'm talking about. I'm going to be talking to a general audience. And so um, I'm going to request in advance um, some concessions from those of you for whom this might be a refresher rather than, uh, rather than new information. So medical schools and particularly public medical schools like the University of California system are a public good. And it's important that we recognize what that means for our communities. We are an investment of the citizens of the state of California who have decided to support us um, so that we can prepare the workforce that's needed for all of those who might seek healthcare, seek preventive care, seek curative care, or seek compassionate palliative care at the ends of their lives. But it's also important, again, particularly for public institutions, to make sure that we prepare our citizens to be informed, impactful, and contributing um, citizens for our profession and for our democracy. Um, and this is often something that is not talked a lot about in medical education, but I think it's a critical role that has been really amplified by the most recent 20 months of pandemic, where we saw the importance of physicians advocating for better public health systems, for better vaccination processes, for better um, care delivery in underserved areas. And so as we think about what types of doctors our nation needs, we have to consider both their roles in the exam room, in the hospital, in the operating room, um, but also their roles as they go about their day-to-day -day personal lives um, and participate in school boards in local and national elections uh, and are asked to, to provide input for individuals who seek their uh, advice and trust the, trust the information that they give them because of their education. So I want you to think about what it would mean if every medical school in the country embraced this responsibility to design their curricula to ensure that the communities in which these medical schools lived and existed, in which their community members were employed, um, in which their um, faculty and their learners sent their children to schools, what it, would it mean for us to design our curriculum to ensure that our communities were arenas and ecosystems of health? Um, and what could we accomplish if in fact this was part of our goal and our core mission? It would be an astonishing um, transition away from medical schools whose focus on education is really based on what um, legacy faculty have decided to teach rather than what current, cur current communities really need to achieve their goals of healthy, productive uh, lives free of preventable illness. 
I think what it means is that we have to be prepared to ensure that the graduates we have are the types of graduates that we have 100% confidence in. And they're the types of people who we would choose to care for someone that we care deeply about. We would trust the care of our mother, our sister, our brother, our spouse, our children to these individuals. And so that commitment is something I take very seriously, particularly given the challenges I've had with my own family's healthcare. But it also means that we need as physicians to understand that in the healthcare arena, we and other health professionals like nurses, pharmacists, dentists, social workers, um, therapists, and others are going to be comfortable leading the changes that we'll need to achieve in order to get to this goal of healthy communities across the country. But we'll also have to be prepared to support and step back as other experts in our environment, public health experts, government officials, elected um, individuals, um, need support in some of the changes that they should be making to make sure that the um, environments in which our families and our patients and their families live are supportive of good health, in which there are no food deserts where people can always have access to healthy foods, where there are no places where people have to fear walking and doing their daily exercise, where their children go to good schools. And so this is a world that we could achieve if we targeted this as specific goals as an academic institution and encouraged the other, other medical schools across the country to do the same. Now it's impossible to give a talk in 2021 without thinking about the impact of the pandemic and what the pandemic has taught us. And I think um, um, as we are coming out of this, hopefully um, now we have this Omicron problem coming up on us, but we're hoping that the pandemic is behind us in many ways. Um, there's often people kind of yearning for let's go back to normal. Um, but there's a British novelist named Zadie Smith, um, who's a black woman who wrote a series of essays in the pandemic. And she um, made the very astute observation that when people and communities and nations come through a period of trauma, whether it's pandemic or war, um, you don't find people wanting to go back to normal um, because they don't want to return to the circumstances that led them into the catastrophe that they just endured. Her quote, which I think is really relevant and has made me um, pause and think a lot, is that disaster demands a new dawn. So as we're thinking about coming out of this pandemic and we're thinking about medical education and recovering from the disruptions of remote learning and altered clinical experiences and things like that, I think it's important that we take this opportunity to kind of seize the urgency of the pandemic and think that we need to not only prepare this future generation to be effective in pandemic crises, um, which are gonna be, largely relatively short periods of extraordinary work by individuals, important um, crisis management, public health infrastructure, things like that. But more importantly is the work we have to do in the periods between pandemics. And I think that we should be stress testing the success of our medical education environment um, based on a commitment to ensure that we've produced the optimal workforce that can deliver high quality, equitable, patient-centered care daily in every community, to every person, regardless of their power and privilege. That is an aspirational goal that I am willing to work for. Um, and I know that my colleagues at UCSF, particularly led by Dr. Navarro, um, are also willing to work for. Now, as we think about this, we have to think about the fact that while all patients are vulnerable by virtue of their illness or their concern about illness, and the, the power hierarchy that exists because of information, um, information hierarchies between physicians and their patients that often exist, um, there are communities that have been historically marginalized, excluded, oppressed, and discriminated against, and they're even more vulnerable. And it is important that the 21st century workforce that's going to be caring for diverse populations also be prepared to address health and healthcare disparities. Um, this means that we have to work um, with due diligence to recruit and educate a workforce that is diverse, as diverse, hopefully, as our communities are but also ensure that even those who come from populations that have historically not been um, minority in medicine, so particularly white, 
male and female populations, that they also take on the responsibility for understanding the role that structural and interpersonal racism plays in health and healthcare disparities. We teach our students all the time that if you just memorize the lists of signs and symptoms that a particular disease or condition conveys, you will be an okay doctor, but not as extraordinary doctor. To really understand disease um, and illness, you have to actually understand what is happening in that person's body and in that life. The same is true about understanding health and healthcare disparities. If you simply memorize the fact that health and healthcare disparities exist, um, you will be an average or an okay doctor. But if you truly understand the forces that presented to individuals that force them into conditions um, that have adverse social determinants of health, um, then you will be a person who is empowered to make real and substantial change in your institutions, in your profession, and hopefully in your communities. Health and healthcare disparities are slightly different. Health disparities um, are the described differences between populations in terms of illness, suffering, and death that exist because of a number of forces, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, forces of economics, forces of criminal justice, forces of housing problems. Healthcare disparities, however, um, are the differences in healthcare outcomes that arise because of actions and decisions by healthcare professionals. We as citizens can affect healthcare, health disparities. We as physicians own healthcare disparities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. The other dynamic that we have is the interaction between structural racism and interpersonal racism. And as you'll see in the next several slides, structural racism that exists in virtually all social systems within the United States and has for centuries um, is the main reason why we see people with substantial disadvantage and the main reason why we see people who are subject to interpersonal racism, bias, and discrimination. So 21st century structural racism, and I'm not talking about slavery, I am talking about um, existing policies and procedures that were enacted in the 20th century and continue to have manifestations and consequences in the 21st century um, through the Jim Crow South, but also to and beyond the, um, the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, result from policies and laws, practices that disproportionately disadvantage racial ethnic populations, and they're often very synergistic, and we'll talk about some of these on the next several slides, but they include decisions that uh, governments have made about economic policies, about housing policies, social support policies, education, the way it's funded and enacted, criminal justice, and yes, healthcare financing and healthcare delivery policies. So here's some examples I'd like to point out for people. And again, with apologies to those of you for whom this is very familiar, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same, um, same page when it comes to understanding um, the types of information that our medical students need to learn to understand. And because they are educated um, as medical students in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and colleges across the country, some do enter medical school with a very rudimentary, if um, sometimes negative, understanding of what structural racism exists, how structural racism exists and plays out to, to even today. So in the 1930s, there were a series of decisions that were made by the federal government um, to enact social support systems. And they included things like in the 30s, social security, um, legislation, the GI Bill, and, and uh, the FHA redlining strategies. All of these contributed to poverty and a substantial wealth gap, in, particularly in communities of Black Americans and previously enslaved Americans. Social Security, in order to pass, the Southern Democrats um, required appeasement, and they made the decision to not support Social Security and not allow Social Security to be given to domestic workers and agricultural workers, which were the two main employers of uh, Black Americans following the, following the um, release of slavery. The GI Bill was also contained discriminatory language about who could be entitled to an education based on the GI Bill, despite the fact there were a number of Black troops that participated in, in the war, the World War II and beyond. And FHA redlining restricted mortgages um, to Black Americans, such that they were unable to buy houses in um, 
in neighborhoods that were predominantly white. Now, the consequences of these have been intergenerational and far reaching, because if you think a little bit about this, social security, if you don't have social security as a worker, that means that you, as at the time you retire, um, essentially become impoverished. You have nothing to support yourselves, particularly if you've been a minimum wage worker. What does that mean? It means you have no money to transfer in wealth to your subsequent generations. And it often means that your children um, who take care of you in your old age after you're no longer able to work your minimum wage job also have no way to save money in order for them to actually transition and transfer wealth to the next generation. If you cannot buy a home that appreciates in value, you cannot use your home, which is the major source of wealth for most Americans, um, to, again, transfer assets and transfer wealth um, to your children. Um, and so this has longstanding intergenerational impact, and it can contributes to this median household gap in wealth, not income, but wealth. These are sort of the assets after income, where an average white family in 2015, and the numbers I just looked up this afternoon are quite similar, has an average household wealth of 171,000. The average African-American family, exactly $100,000 less than that. These are um, astonishing figures, and it tells you where um, people actually are vulnerable with regard to um, bills related to a health injury or a health um, illness that requires additional investments. So you see this is tremendous, and this has actually not made substantial progress in recent years. Um, the same issues that contributed to problems with housing have caused structural racism in K through 16 education. Um, most, most communities um, support their educational environments through property values based funding. If you and your family live in an area that is an environmentally toxic area, because that's the only place that um, Black Americans were allowed to purchase houses and have mortgages in, um, then your schools are going to be underfunded. This contributes to lower levels of teacher quality, um, where um, Black students are much more likely to have a teacher who has no expertise in the subject they're teaching, particularly math or science, who is a new teacher rather than an experienced teacher, or a teacher who changes one or more times during a year. So all of these contribute um, to decreased educational quality for students who are already disadvantaged based on uh, the lack of wealth that their families have. Um, Strategies that allow teachers to handpick gifted and talented selection and access and also testing for learning disorders um, are also have also been shown to disadvantage students of color. Um, and school-based discipline is more harshly meted out in black students, particularly black boys um, in elementary school, which contributes to their um, loss of interest in school and oftentimes disruption in their schooling. Legacy admissions to universities is an area that also disadvantages systematically communities of color. And when achievement tests, which measure the extent to which you have learned a specific subject, are used as aptitude tests, meaning your ability to learn more of that subject, um, that also contributes to um, educational disadvantage in K through 16 education. So these all are synergistic. And actually, what you see is often more disrupted schooling, higher dropout rates, lower college entry and graduation rates, and fewer advanced degrees like MD, nurse practitioner, PharmD, or others. Now, I want to just um, highlight some work that was done from an article published by two of our medical students when they were first year medical students. Um, and this just shows um, the things I've been talking about at the Bay Area. I know we pride ourselves in being a very tolerant an inclusive community. But in fact, if you look for racism in the San Francisco Bay Area, you will see this just the same way you see it in other communities across the country. So on the left-hand side, you see a homeowner's loan corporation 1935 map, which commissioned by the Federal Home Loan Board that designated and ranked different neighborhoods according to suitability for mortgage lending. And in the red, you see hazardous and yellow is definitely declining areas. And you, of course, know where these are. These are in the um, Bayview Hunters Point area and the Tenderloin area um, and in, in the middle of the city. At the same time, you see on the other side, current map of highest performing and lowest performing schools. Um, the highest performing schools are the light green and dark green. The lowest performing schools are the yellow and orange and the red, uh, one, two, and three. And what you see almost exactly is an overlap in 2000 and 
15, um, an overlap of poor quality schools in the areas that were redlined back in 1935. So if you have any doubts about the persistence of the consequences of structural racism, I think that this is evidence um, that we see this right in our own backyards, no matter how um, liberal and tolerant we consider our environment to be. Now, structural racism and criminal justice has to be talked about as well. Um, the broken windows ideology that allows people to stop and frisk individuals by virtue of what, whether they look suspicious has disadvantaged um, African-American men in particular. Police funding strategies that allow them to issue tickets um, to generate the money that they need to run their department and actually often allows them to decide who will be issued that ticket. The bail to jail system where people are jailed not because they've been found guilty, um, but they're put in jail before they are convicted because they don't have the money to pay for those fines. This dis systematically disadvantages those individuals who don't have the wealth to have additional resources beyond what they need to live to pay for um, fines and things like that. Three strikes policies, um, again, this war on crime that was started in the 90s by a Democratic public pr president, drug crime disparities between crack and cocaine, differential use of force, if we've seen the tragedies of that in recent, in recent years, and imp importantly, voter disenfranchisement of people who have paid their debts to societies. All of these things actually also contribute to loss of jobs, loss of child custody, broken homes and communities, uh, which makes it even more difficult for people to pull themselves out of poverty and into um, better environments and better, form, better functioning school systems. Now, 21st century racism also exists, exists on the interpersonal side of things. And the interpersonal issues are often reinforced by or are the agents of structural racism. For example, if you tell police that they can actually stop whoever they want, um, they may actually intentionally, based on their unconscious bias and their belief that Blacks may, um, correct or not, that the Blacks may actually have more reason to be pulled over, they become a, an agent of the structural racism. And that in many ways reinforces their own interpersonal bias. Um, it may have reflect overt racism, but often really reflects unintentional or unconscious bias. Now, um, these are all about social systems outside of medicine, but I want us to really reckon with the issues that medicine itself, the profession of medicine in the United States, has a dark history of discrimination and exploitation um, against people of color, and particularly uh, Blacks and previously enslaved individuals. The father of um, modern gynecology, J. Marion Sims, um, acquired his understanding of human physiology based on experimentation on enslaved women um, against their will and often operations without anesthesia. It is just amazing, horrifying, really, to understand how he acquired the knowledge of female um, gynecologic anatomy and physiology um, by exploiting women. Um, we didn't do much better in the 20th century. The Flexner Report, which is often, Flexner is often referred to as the, the father of modern Mer American medicine. Um, I always like to talk about him as the first, first phase of modern American medicine. No longer do we, do we celebrate the Flexner name. But his report closed almost all of the Black serving medical schools and includes very specifically racist commentary um, about um, individuals participating in those schools. All are familiar, I think, with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment where Black men, sharecroppers in particular, um, were allowed to um, continue to suffer from syphilis despite the availability of an effective treatment midway through this study um, until they actually died um, of serious complications in the 70s. This was 1970s when the Tuskegee experiment was, was uncovered um, uh, um, publicized and it was halted at that point, 1970s, right? And then there was another um, very um, disturbing trial, the Femflurmine trial, which examined aggression in healthy black and brown teenage boys in the inner city um, because they had a sibling who had um, a, a been described as a um, individual with challenging um, personality quirks. And so this was medicating poor um, individuals without virtue of modern um, protection. Uh, and it targeted black and brown teenage boys. And even when it was exposed, their argument was, well, we, were, we hadn't gotten to the white boys yet. Um, and in, the uh, consequences of these is that we in medicine are still using information that was gathered based on 
um, racist, exploitive, oppressive, and discriminatory uh, constructs. And some of those continue in the minds of um, doctors today, and we'll talk a little bit about how they contribute to healthcare disparities. So U.S. healthcare disparities, and I want to distinguish this again from health disparities, which is a more overarching umbrella um, that includes things like poverty, educational level, access to health care. But health care disparities, according to the Institute of Medicine's book on equal treatment, which was released in about in the early 2000s, 2003 or four, are racial or ethnic differences in the quality of health care that's not due to access related factors. So it's not due to whether or not you have insurance, whether or not you have a doctor in your area, or patient preferences, I, not due to whether or not you chose to reject or consent to a physician's recommendations or clinical appropriateness. But these are differences in healthcare outcomes in terms of suffering, in terms of duration of illness, in terms of life or death statistics that are seen in almost all conditions and they always, they always disadvantage um, communities of color. So here's a few statistics. And one of the things that drives my work in medical education is the recognition that the physicians that we educate somehow through their exposure to structural racist policies, through their exposure to individuals who have suffered at the hands of structural racism, have um, drawn, and through their exposure to clinical research that has not included and appropriately categorized outcomes by virtue of race and ethnicity have developed very dysfunctional ideas of how illness or disease should be treated in different individuals. So um, here's a sampling of this. White physicians are slower to provide evidence-based HIV care for African-American patients because they are concerned that they will not be compliant and might contribute to um, resistance in the medications, despite the fact that there is no observ observable difference between these populations in terms of compliance. Um, Black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain compared with their white counterparts. This has been shown in long bone fracture. So a Black young man who comes in with a femur fracture from a motor vehicle accident will receive fewer pain medications and lower doses than their white counterpart with the exact same injury. And it's been shown in children with appendicitis. Now think a little bit about that. You as a doctor are treating two children with appendicitis and one of them you decide has enough pain that they merit higher dose of pain medication. And another you think um, they're probably just malingering, you're gonna give them a little bit less. That to me is just really appalling. Um, Oftentimes white physicians in studies have been shown to rate people of color more often as less intelligent, less educated, more likely to engage in substances, more likely to be non-compliant and important for some other issues like for example, renal transplantation to lack social support. And this belief that black um, individuals have less social support contributes to the observation that black individuals with end stage kidney disease who need transplantation as the best form of replacement for their kidneys um, often are um, not listed for kidneys for several years beyond what a counterpart who is white would be listed. And the irony, of course, is all of this is subconscious. I, no one teaches people about this, but somehow the water in which we swim, the water in which students are educated and residents are educated and physicians are treated is encouraging them to think differently about people based on the color of their skin. When we know, in fact, that race is not a biologic construct, it is a social construct, and there is nothing that actually supports any of these um, descriptors that we are talking about. So the epidemic of healthcare disparities, if we eliminated this, if Black Americans um, lived as long as white Americans do and died from preventable disease as infrequently as white Americans do, we would save 75,000 excess, 75,000 people a year. Now, in the pandemic, we were upset because 600,000, or now I think it's about 750,000 people um, have died. And that was, of course, a tragedy in a period of, of 20 months. But think a little bit about this. This is a tragedy too. And over a period of a decade, we would also lose those 750,000 people. And we have it within ourselves, the ability to elevate the care delivered to people of color beyond those challenges that I've just talked about. And we could in fact save um, hundreds of thousands of lives as an institution if we worked hard on this problem. 
So what does this mean for education? It means that we actually have to incorporate social justice and social accountability into medical education and healthcare across every nation. And this means all medical schools have to act in concert. It's not sufficient just for UCSF to do it, but all the UC systems should do this, as should all of the Iowa systems, all of the New England systems. And this requires, I think, three types of work. One is repair work. And I know you had a um, conversation with Amy Medeiros, who's done really remarkable work in this. But we need to actually learn, acknowledge, and seek to repair the damage done by a history of medical exploitation experimentation and neglect of, of, of vulnerable communities. Secondly, we need to actually re-envision excellence in all programs at all levels of medical education and other health professions to include diversity at every level, in every role, in each specialty, and ensure that equity accompanies diversity in all the processes we think about in terms of promotion, advancement, and leadership selection. And thirdly, we have to engineer equity and anti-depression into every element of education. Structural racism was engineered into the US fabric. In order to counteract structural racism, we have to re-engineer equity into the US fabric. And in medical education, that means we have to think about this in every part of every educational program that we participate in. And if we're successful at this, then all health professionals, and I would say doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, therapists, dentists, everyone should have the ability to describe concepts of race, structural racism, and their relationship to healthcare disparities, should be able to champion as informed citizens the elimination of healthcare disparities within medicine and society in general should be able to look inside themselves and hold them individually and personally accountable for their mitigating their own biases and their patient and their peer and their educational encounters and hold their institutions um, accountable for measuring and improving healthcare equity, just as we hold them accountable for decreasing medical errors and improving the quality of medical care in, in areas other than equity. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now, um, switch gears to what is happening on the ground here at UCSF. So thank you for your forbearance and letting me set the context. I think it's really important um, to, to hear how we have been thinking about these and what we are doing at this point. So the elements of educating for equity are the elements of education. And people always think about, well, what are you gonna teach? What's the curriculum? But in fact, it begins sooner than that. It begins with admissions and financial aid. It then extends to the curriculum um, for all students. It extends to opportunities for different cohorts of students who might have different career paths that could actually accelerate the work towards equity and inclusion. It, it extends definitely into the ways that we measure the success and sponsor individuals who are medical students for um, important careers in medicine. And lastly, we need to support all of our students, but in particular, those who have been historically excluded by the medical profession. So admissions, let me talk a little bit about admissions. Um, we have a wonderful new admissions dean, Michelle Albert, um, who is currently the president of the American, uh, she is the president-elect of the American Heart Association, the current president of the Association of Black Cardiologists. She is a distinguished professor in um, cardiology and, and part of her work is to actually help us select the right class of medical students that we need. Um, her um, phrase is that we are birthing success in healthcare and healthcare equity. And, and our goal is to make sure that every student has a role, every graduate has a role in addressing healthcare equity um, for all the patients that they will come in contact to across their careers, which of course, as you know, will span probably 40 and sometimes 50 years. The way we do this is a process known as holistic admissions. And holistic admissions helps you make decisions to select the right students. And we'll show you in a minute about how many students we have to sift through in order to get our classes um, tied to an institution's mission um, and strategically focused on at UCSF diversity and inclusion. And we use data from typical scores that you might know about the MCAT scores and the grade point averages, but we also look carefully at other important qualities that will help us craft that type of the workforce that we need. Holistic review is um, an experience where we look, yes, at metrics, MCAT scores, grade point average, and grade trends to make sure that someone has um, achieved the level of um, knowledge in science courses that will help them succeed in medical school. But that's only one part of the three-part experience. We also look at attributes. Um, what is their gender identity, their faith, their family status, 
the types of perspectives they've had, their values and beliefs, their race and sexual orientation, and also their life experiences. How, um, how have they come to a career in medicine and what will they bring that will help them both educate their peers in medical school, but also will help them become a contributing member to that workforce that our nation needs. Experience, one of the things we look at is distance traveled, as we talked about. Um, if you are a individual who has been privileged enough to have a, come from a wealthy family, our legacy admission to an Ivy League institution, have gotten lots of opportunities to take extra years to do research because you didn't need to work on your way through high school or college, um, your MCAT score might be um, superior, but um, somebody else who has achieved the same MCAT score, despite the fact that they had a lot of disadvantages, might bring something to the class that, uh, that allows us to recognize some hidden talents that we want to support and endorse. Um, other things we look for is um, first generations. Um, most of the people in the United States did not go to college. Most of the adults in the United States did not go to college. And when we think about diversity, we often think about race and ethnicity. But our, um, our communities in rural areas like the Central Valley, where we're doing some work to increase the opportunity for students from that area to come to medical school, um, is, has a, a large number of people who did not go to college and whose um, health care might be better if they saw people similar to themselves um, in these roles. So here's the numbers that we have to, when we look at these things, you might sort of realize that it's easy to sort of screen people based on numbers, right? You could just put a computer system and sort of say, we wanna look at MCAT scores greater than a certain number and everybody else goes away. Um, we don't do that. We look at the whole application. And that means we have to sift through almost 10,000 applications in order to full, fill our class of 161 students. Um, and so um, we interview about 600. So if you get to an interview stage, your, your, your chances are pretty good. Um, but if you're just an application stage, it's a really daunting opportunity to get to go to UCSF. And this is our class today, which reflects our commitment to both Cal the state of California as a as the in individuals who fund our school, um, but also to the need for broader diversity in our communities. Our class is about 52% women. It's been majority women. That is somewhere between 50 and 55% for about, um, I think as long as I've been here, which is 10 years. Um, we have the greatest number of underrepresented in medicine students. That's 52% this year. And um, almost 80% of our students are California residents. Most of them are about 23 years old, which means they've come to medical school a year or so after they graduated from college. One of the things that actually makes it helpful for us to recruit diverse students who we believe not only will contribute to that workforce, but also really enrich our culture, the change we're trying to achieve in terms of equity and inclusion, and the education of their peers um, is adequate financial aid. Again, remember the wealth issue that I talked about. If you come from a family that has a high income and high wealth, you may in fact be able to support your son or daughter or um, relative in medical school for their tuition, their fees, and you know when they're and when their computer gets stolen out of their car down in Union Square. Um, but if you come from a family with very little wealth, they may not be able to provide that resource. And so what we've tried to do is raise sufficient funds uh, to make sure that we can meet 100% of demonstrated need. This doesn't mean students graduate with no debt. That means they graduate from debt with debt that's about 90 to $100,000 rather than 100 to $300,000. And what we saw when we were able to raise more funds and we could still use additional funds um, is that um, we really dramatically increased the yield from about 33% of all students um, from underrepresented groups who were offered admission to 56%, um, so very close to what we see in all entering students. So this was really a, a good test of concept that providing more resources helps people choose UCSF. And what we hear from our students oftentimes is that UCSF was my dream school and I wanted to come here, um, but I couldn't because someone else gave me more financial aid. And so we're beginning to make inroads into that strategy. 
The curriculum, let's talk about curriculum. So curriculum often, um, when you think about this, often people think about a major in college, but in medical school, it's a little bit different. It isn't about a series of courses that you can choose to pick and take over a period of about four years. It's what we call a lockstep curriculum. So um, every student takes the same curriculum beginning on day one and ending at the time that they graduate. And the way we design this is what we call design thinking approach. We start at the right-hand side of this arrow and sort of say, who's the ideal UCSF graduate? What kind of problems are they going to need to solve? Who do they need to be as individuals? And what um, roles are they going to accept as they um, enter the workforce? Then we work backwards and sort of say, well, if this is who they need to be, what kind of abilities will they need to have? These are called competencies in our language. If that's the type of competencies they need, then what do we need to teach? This is the content or courses. And if we're going to teach this content, what's the best way to teach it? And along the way, we always ask, do we have the right faculty? Um, how do we know our learners are ready, which is assessment? And then how do we make sure that they're aspiring to the types of careers that will help them be maximally impactful and create careers that they're thriving in? So in 2016, we launched this Bridges curriculum, which is the curriculum we are operating under with a, with a goal of ensuring that um, what I talked about at the beginning was true, that we would craft our curriculum to meet the needs of our communities and to improve the health of our communities writ large and decrease the burden of suffering from illness and disease in our individual patients. And we also recognized that um, there's something special about UCSF. We are an, an outstanding institution. We are by no means perfect. But we have a set of core values and we are a striving institution, striving to be better in many ways, particularly equity and inclusion. And so we do think that you will know a UCSF School of Medicine graduate by the way they approach their patients. And that means that they're all prepared, each graduate to deliver outstanding patient care regardless of the patient's power or privilege and to do so aligned with a set of core values. And that we also provide for different cohorts of students the opportunity to be prepared to lead in advancing care delivery, public policy, medical education, um, anti-racism, so that they can actually contribute to the solution of problems that have gone unsolved to the state. The, the wisdom of this approach and the strategies that we embraced with the Bridges Curriculum in 2016 were really highlighted by the success of physicians in the COVID pandemic. Um, as well as the ongoing race, racist acts that were illustrated um, by the death of George Floyd and others um, that coincided with the pandemic. Um, we recognized the importance of a, 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 a workforce that was diverse and regionally representative that had careers that would address all areas in which physicians would contribute. So that means when we set out to create our, our, our class, we don't set out to create 100% of physician scientists or 100% of community advocates or 100% of primary care doctors. We want a spectrum of individuals with commitments that will allow them um, to contribute in all the ways that, that um, healthcare workforce needs to contribute. Um, they're prepared to contribute to solutions to unsolved problems, which requires that they learn science, not just from physiology perspective, but psychology and systems engineering and education that they um, embrace the habits of mind of inquiry, that's science for society, patient, truly patient-centered care, where each patient is given the care and the support and the information that they need in a way that they can master their own fate uh, with a physician as a supporting partner, not as a patriarchal um, authoritarian. And importantly, social justice and accountability. And one of the things that the pandemic illustrated for us too, which is a little bit, I think of a, a new insight for us was that um, everyone will have a certain core set of principles. Um, but in addition, the, we need to train leaders in each of these areas, the physician scientist, the physician public health advocate, the physician anti-racism expert, physician policy expert. These are individuals who will take largely additional time to um, acquire more skills so that they can head up the organizations that need to be changed um, and that need to be adapted away from the, those that have been disadvantaging people over the years. So our journey on the social justice aspect has been pretty long and pretty um, tumultuous. Um, I would say that our students have been incredible advocates and activists 
in helping us understand where we were doing well and where we still needed to do additional work. Um, the start of this um, really began with a student die-in after the death of Michael Brown in 2014 um, and has continued with activism even this month about changes that they want to see in the anti-racism aspect of the curriculum. Um, but along the way, and I don't intend to sort of go through each of these things, what I want to sort of emphasize is we have tried to do this work um, in a strategic way that looks both at educating individuals and holding individuals accountable, but also at creating differential structures, systems, policies to sustain the work beyond any individual. Um, and I think that's going to continue to be the, the success that we need going forward. Now this year, um, in response to a lot of the analysis of where we thought we needed to improve, we did launch something as known as the Anti-Oppressive Curriculum Initiative. So this is a, a, a broader than anti-racism, but it's based in racism as the original sin and the structures that have led to all other forms of oppression in the United States. Um, it's important because um, we recognize how racism has infiltrated medicine as well as society, and that has contributed to differential outcomes for people um, of color. Um, everyone, as we've said, uh, in alignment with our Bridges philosophy, deserves equitable, anti-racist, and anti-oppressive healthcare. And this means that we as physicians need to take responsibility uh, for making sure that our systems within the profession of medicine and the care and the institutions in which we deliver care um, are redesigned to counteract the long-term consequences um, and manifestations of structural racism. In addition, it's important for our increasingly diverse students who need to be in an environment that is not traumatizing and that does not sort of reinforce um, differential impact and opportunity for students of color or students who come from groups that have historically been marginalized, which includes not only racial and ethnic minorities, but also sexual orientation and gender identity minorities. So what will be the outcome if we are successful in this work, which is right now planned for a major design and implementation phase, which will last for three years, but will continue on beyond that, that our graduates will review the system structures, interactions, and outcomes within healthcare through an anti-racist and an anti-oppressive um, social justice lens, and they'll be on a path towards um, acknowledging historical trauma and current day harms, learning to partner effectively with individuals and communities who've experienced oppression so that their health can be optimized and their trust in the medical profession can be restored. So they can join and create and sustain non-hierarchical healthcare teams and uplift voices from those who've been historically excluded and develop structural and sustainable solutions for, for restoring that trust and forming the types of healing relationships that all patients deserve, uh, regardless of the histories of this country. This work is being done through financed positions for faculty and staff with plans to actively engage community experts who can provide, we think, some of the expertise that um, our faculty do not currently have yet on route to becoming the institution we want to be. And of course, our students will have a uh, tremendous impact on the work that is accomplished, as well as be the beneficiaries and the critical appraisers of the work that we do. I just wanna make a couple comments about um, career planning for leaders in essential areas. Just as a point of pride, all of the UC systems um, for the UC medical schools have committed to um, recruit and train individuals to serve specific populations that have been historically excluded. And you can see the list here, rural populations, urban, Latinx, Native American, African, Black, and Caribbean, and those practitioners who intend to have a health equity or public and community health approach. We also are trying to design innovative programs to prepare the faculty of the future, because if you want to choose change an institution, you have to change the people who are there for life. It's great to have students who are catalysts, but what you really need is the faculty have to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion as core to their work. And so what we work on is the different ways in which graduates might choose to pursue faculty careers in academic medicine. I wanna make one comment or a couple of comments on assessment because assessment was one of the first things we tackled. Um, we had learners who looked and sort of said to us, we think that people who are being recognized for academic excellence are disproportionately white compared to the um, class. And they wanted to know if in fact our assessments were biased. 
And so this, this took us down a very interesting research path, um, which showed, in fact, that the concerns the students raised were true. In fact, there were um, consistent differences between populations who um, were well represented in medicine, predominantly um, white men, and populations who were underrepresented in medicine. And none of it could be explained by preparation or exam scores. It all had to do um, with the systems of assessment and grading that we used. And so we set off to create an, a strategy of equity and assessment where all learners had the opportunity to learn, to be coached and receive feedback, to be assessed and graded, advanced and graduated, and be selected for subsequent training and career opportunities. Um, and so this has been a large part of our work. I would just show kind of of interest. Um, what we saw was that um, the average not UIM, or some people call that well-represented medicine, had an average course score of 3.6 whereas the, non uh, the underrepresented event had a course score of about 3.5. So that's like a tenth of a point difference. And let me tell you, medical education is not like the Olympics. We don't have any like stopwatches that are good to like 0.000%. Um, this is a, this is a non, non significant difference. But what we saw based on the way we use those numbers is this very tiny difference was amplified in the decisions we made about how we use those scores such that there was tremendous disparities in um, identifying people for the highest honors in medical school. And why is that important? Because those um, are the types of information that people use to make decisions about who gets into a very elite residency programs and who becomes a faculty person. So we have done a lot of work on equity and assessment. Um, and we are continuing with a redesign of our programs that have um, substantially decreased the differences and also along the way improved the well being of our students. And this has been picked up nationally and has contributed to some of the changes that we are seeing nationally in a move away from um, artificial numbers for high stakes examinations like the medical boards um, and towards a pass fail system which will be more advantageous for our students. The last thing I want to just comment on is student support because it is critically important when you are recruiting students into an environment that uh, in which the students are in some ways the, the the pioneers of diversity that you provide adequate support. Um, and what one of our philosophies has been, and we've been supported in this work by Dr. Navarro's, Navarro's office to meet students where they are and give them the support that they need. This is what equity means. Not everyone gets the same leg up but people get whatever leg up they need to reach that apple or to reach the career that they want to have. Um, this includes a coaching program where students are assigned to a coach, six students to a coach who can provide uh, mental support, physical support, um, some teaching and also emotional support through medical school. Learning resources for students who might be first generation to medical school can be really challenging. Well-being programs to keep people healthy and help them create an environment of health, despite the fact that they're working hard. Community building is absolutely essential. Sometimes you wanna be a member of a diverse community. Sometimes you want to be um, with people who have shared experience with you. And we have to have both of these. Mental health support is important. Mental health is, um, medical education can be very draining. And most importantly, career advising so that students actually know to what they should aspire and can see themselves in the very most competitive careers. And so these are really critical resources that we're grateful to be at UCSF for because our Dean and Provost have been helpful in funding them. So I'll close with this. This is a lot of information and hopefully there'll be some questions for us to have a discussion. It's important to understand that medical education and healthcare delivery exist in a very complex ecosystem. That's what makes this work challenging. It's hard because it's a little bit like whack-a-mole. Every time you fix one thing, something else pops up. Um, every time you actually think you have all the faculty on board, you get new faculty on board and new learners on board. And the environments in which we are doing our work, the, the norms around diversity, around equity, around sexual orientation and gender identity minorities, they are evolving as well. And so we have to be in this for the long run. We have to be comfortable with the fact that each year we are going to have to be listening carefully to the environment around us, taking advice from our learners as well as the esteemed faculty. Um, and making the difference, making the changes we need to so that we can achieve equity, which, um, which is what our communities deserve, what our learners deserve, and really what our nation needs.
And so with that, I will um, invite any questions or comments and thank you again to Alejandra and to Dr. Navarro for inviting me to speak tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That was an outstanding presentation, Dr. Lucy. I wanna thank you for your leadership at UCSF and your persistence in, in really working through these really critical issues. There are two questions so far in the question and answer. And the first one is around the definition of underrepresented in medicine. And it, it says that um, a lot of the medical colleges don't consider Asian people as URMs. However, under the pan-ethnic label of Asian, there are Asian minority groups, such as the low caste South Asian people, Hmong, Chinese people, et cetera, that are largely excluded from this. What is UCSF doing to include these populations in healthcare and in medicine? Yeah, I think that's a very important observation. And I think there's two issues there that are critical for us to consider. One is um, Asian is not an ethnicity. It's a, it's a categorization, it's a social categorization. Um, and um, that is not a monolithic population. And so some have been highly advantaged um, and some remain disadvantaged and underrepresented. And so we, we do look at specific underrepresented um, individuals from different Asian sub, subcultures and subsets. Um, it's very challenging. What's interesting, we have a lot of multiracial students at UCSF, and one of the biggest challenges is to create kind of a taxonomy of measurement that allows us to identify where we might need to put additional resources to um, recruit specific individuals from those populations um, that may not have been um, advantaged with the more broad label of underrepresented in medicine. The second is, is that, um, uh, Asian individuals, again, the monolithic Asian descriptor, may not be underrepresented in medicine, but they are underrepresented in leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I think Dr. Navarro has made a big effort to try and diversify leadership um, at the staff level as well as the faculty and senior level. Um, and what we do see is that, you know, even those populations who are well, Asian populations who are well represented, um, uh, somehow fall out of the leadership pipeline. And so I think we have to be really thoughtful and some of the work that Dr. Navarro and her team has done in trying to um, create a broader picture of who makes up our workforce at each level is I think really instrumental to, to doing the right thing for all populations. Excellent, thank you. Um, the second question is from uh, Monica Lassar. Given that you're training amazing Black African Americans and other people of color, clinician leaders, teachers, and activists, how do you support them in serving communities they come from without quote unquote chaining them to the plantation of low pay and agencies and clinics which are under resourced but have the highest need? Oh, um, so nice to hear from you. You always ask the best questions. Thank you. Um, you know, I find that to be a really challenging issue. I, I um, we had to write this paper about medical education post the pandemic. And one of the things that is um, really striking to me is that the United States, believe it or not, does not have a national workforce plan for physicians. They just simply don't. They rely on this, like, well, we'll recruit these students from underserved areas um, so that they return to those underserved areas, you know, which in fact sort of belies the American dream yeah. that education allows you to sort of rise away from this. And, and, and the, the, the responsibility for um, supporting communities that have been under-resourced or are medical deserts um, can't just be um, based on the you know, individual goals of a single student who you recruited from there or from people who sort of um, fly in during a pandemic, which was absolutely needed, but you can't count on that as regular healthcare. So you know, if I had a magic wand tomorrow, I would create a national healthcare workforce plan that made sure that every community in the US had adequate physicians. And probably the way to do that, honestly, is a mandatory um, service for tuition um, program for all doctors that you couldn't opt out of. Um, because it really shouldn't be the responsibilities of, of um, individuals who live in those communities to be the ones to solve the problems that are structural in nature. Um, but, you know, part of the challenge, too, is we don't want to be um, paternalistic about this. If students want to go back to those communities, 
then they should go back to those communities and we should do everything we can to support them in that work. Um, but we'll also see students sometimes who decide that the best way they can serve their community is to become, for example, a nephro nephrologist who tackles the root causes of, of you know, hypertensive kidney disease in communities um, that they came from. But uh, Monica, you probably have a much better answer. I would love to hear what you had to say. I, I guess the question is, why is it then that those positions where there's the greatest need in the patient care population, often the ones who have the late, the lowest reimbursement? So I mean, that's well, that's, yeah, that would be another thing, right? Yeah. So you could change. I mean, that's the other thing you could do is you could just make it very desirable to work there. Um, but but then then you may attract people who are not interested in culturally responsive care, who are just there for the economics of it. So it's a big, it's a big problem. The other thing we see sometimes is, you know, um, in one of the reasons we are building a four-year medical program in the San Joaquin Valley is, you know, these are students, we've got medical students who are on average 23, but some of them 30. They're in the process of meeting somebody they want to spend their life with. Um, maybe they meet somebody who came from New York City. I mean, and, and, and so there's a lot of reasons why people um, don't want to go back to environments. And the other part of it is oftentimes those environments aren't adequately enough supported. If you're a primary care doctor and you don't have a cardiologist to refer to, um, that makes your job that much harder. So I 100% agree with you that the solution I don't think can be one-offs, as Monique said, and I don't think it can be rely. I don't think we can put it on the shoulders of students who successfully come to medical school. I think it's a structural problem that that honestly we have to work with our elected officials to solve. Yeah, I'd agree with that. One of the challenges, and you you referred to it a bit, was the faculty. Not the challenge, but the solution and perhaps a challenge because upwards of 2,500 faculty in the School of Medicine and they're actually leading and educating our learners, you know, in the clinical setting and in other places. So and many of them trained, you know, when I trained and you trained and how do we go about assuring that the faculty have the capacity to actually educate our students in the manners in which you described in your presentation? And what have been some of the challenges with that? Yeah, there's a lot of challenges. Um, it, you know, um, there is a statistic that's quoted, um, which I think is probably true, that it takes about 20 years from the discovery of a new scientific advance until that discovery is in a widespread general practice. So, you know, from discovery of penicillin to the fact where everybody was discovering was using penicillin, it takes about 20 years. It's astonishing, right? The yeah. same, though, is true for um, the, the scholarly understanding of structural racism. It takes a long time if all we do is wait for what I would call a diffusion curve. That is, you know, like, well, okay, well, this generation will teach, and then eventually they'll sort of talk to their older people, and eventually somebody will get it. So this is where I, I like to use the term engineering. Everybody has to be sort of, has to have an accelerated uptake of these constructs. And I think we have to be willing to look beyond our walls um, to community experts who can help us accelerate um, the uptake of important information um, on behalf of faculty. Um, it's hard though, because you know, faculty have all of their own expertise and you know, people like to study what they like to study and sort of saying, well, now not only do you have to be an, an expert in heart failure, but I want you to be an expert in um, heart failure in, um, in historically excluded populations and you have to understand these other issues. Um, you know, it's a challenge um, it, it, to get people to accelerate their learning. Um, so I think in the meantime, we're kind of, I've called this the liminal period. It's a, it's a period of great challenge and, um, and in some ways great risk, right? Because our students are ahead of us in many, some of our students are ahead of us, some are behind, some are ahead. Um, and um, we want to make sure that the education they get um, at the very least is not traumatizing to them, mm -hmm. um, ideally moves meets everyone where they are and moves them a little bit further down the road. Um, and um, we have a number of faculty who are willing to take on that journey. It's a journey that requires courage because you know it's stretching them and it's admitting ignorance or vulnerability. 
Um, but our students demonstrate that courage all the time when they um, when they speak truth to power. And so um, this is what kind of keeps me up at night and keeps us working. Um, if it was easy, we would have finished this already. But um, but I'm sure you know there's plenty of people on this on this um, part, on this this work that could on this um, seminar tonight who probably also have other ideas. Absolutely, thank you. So the question here is, how do you assess future physicians in criteria like culturally responsive care? Those are those are great questions. Um, it's it begins with defining what that means, right? I mean, we we there is this we have to take that term culturally responsive or culturally humble um, care, and we have to break it down into elements and sort of say. Here's how, if you are someone, maybe you come, I, I grew up in Rochester, New York, was I, I had one African-American um, young man in my whole high school class. Um, and then I end up in San Francisco. And so I would be one of these people, you know, 40 years ago who didn't really know too much about culturally um, competent, humble or responsive care. Um, and so I'm going to have to be taught and I'm going to have to be tested that way. One of the ways we do do it is we, um, we can use simulation and what we call standardized patients, which are um, uh, members of the community who have been trained to portray patient encounters. And one of the things we've been working on at UCSF is diversifying um, those individuals who are standardized patients. When I got here in 2011, um, virtually all of those people um, were white upper middle class people who had retired and now had some extra time on their hand. And so now we are working with community groups to um, diversify the number of individuals, number the, the, the types of individuals that our students have to encounter. And I think we'll get to the point where we have sufficient numbers of diverse standardized patients that we can ensure that all students have had and exposure in a controlled environment for us to watch and video them and give them feedback on that. So that's one example of how we do things. The other example is you teach faculty um, to learn what culturally um, competent and culturally, not competent, I don't like that phrase very much anymore, but culturally respective and responsive care looks like and incorporate that into the ratings that they give our students in the clinical environments. Excellent. You mentioned you're from Rochester and you came to San Francisco and you came here in the 80s, which is um, in the middle of the AIDS pandemic at San Francisco General Hospital. Can you share a little bit more about how that influenced who you are now and the, the work that you're doing? You mentioned a bit about how it has informed your looking at communities that are um, historically marginalized and disenfranchised, but did it yeah. fundamentally change the way you practice medicine or? It did. Um, thank you for that question. It really did. And I, you know, at the time, um, at the time I was aware to some extent of the transformation I was undergoing, you know, again, coming from a very homogeneous population to a very diverse population, um, you know, um, you know, sort of awareness of sexual orientation, gender identity minorities, as well as a lot of immigrant patients that I cared for. It's uh, my head, my clinic for all four years of, that I was here at San Francisco General. Um, and, you know, just being exposed to and learning from those patients and the amazing staff and faculty who had made San Francisco General um, their home was was very inspiring to me. I felt like we were really making a difference in the care the people received. And I continue to feel that way. And one of the things that is both um, inspiring and at the same time heartbreaking is how often people um, tell you that, you know, this is the first time a doctor has treated them nicely, um, has listened carefully to them at San Francisco General. And it's, you know, it's the type of things that brings tears to your eyes and not good tears, um, when you think a little bit about what must that be like if you are frightened and, and using a different language and your doctor is being mean to you, like what is that like? Um, but the other thing I learned a lot about during the HIV pandemic was one, um, how solving big complex problems like that requires all hands on deck. So it's not just the basic scientists, but it's the psychologists and the sociologists and the anthropologists um, and the community educators and how um, working in this environment where 
um, the community really rallied around HIV patients and, and provided the support um, was really apparent to me because after I was here, I moved to Boston. And Boston was totally different in the HIV pandemic. There was no community support. People were ostracized consistently. Um, and it was, it was just shocking. Um, so to me, what it taught me was the power of um, wide expertise in different areas, using different lenses to solve problems um, and partnering successfully with the community. What could be done if that uh, if that was the structure that we undertook for all big healthcare problems. And I think we saw that in a pandemic as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it, that's, that's, I mean, before that, I hadn't even really thought about like, what does it mean to like solve a big problem? It was just like, I was going to be a doctor. I was like, I was going to be a pediatrician in upstate New York and I'm not that. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was, um, it was really transformative and um, it was, uh, it was a heartbreaking time. So many people who were my age were dying. Um, I wasn't really quite prepared for that. It was um, it was a very difficult time, and I know you were around at the same time, Renee. You probably had the same same emotional experiences. Very challenging. Very challenging experiences. One of the questions um, asked us about the pipeline um, programs, and they're asking about what is our focus for high school is insinuating that we should be having an impact sooner. And I'm wondering, they're asking if, if college and med school pipeline programs are too late uh -huh. in one's education to make a real impact. And I can start with some of the answer to that and then I'll let you jump in. Because yeah, please do Renee, because there's a lot of good work going on in your office. Well, we're running the Center for Science and Educational Outreach. And in that center, we're able to actually work with the San Francisco Unified School District, other school districts in the Bay Area, to have an impact earlier on. And we, we realized that you know middle school, oftentimes we have to start in middle school to get people on track so that they actually can matriculate at a UC institution, at a CSU. And so our continuous engagement with them, exposure to healthcare careers, support for mentoring and helping them to navigate the college going process, just inst instilling in them that they can go to college. We start with actually elementary school students in a you can go to college approached and then in the middle schools and high school really focusing on exposing them to healthcare opportunities and what those opportunities look like so i think yes we have to continue to support um, the pathways and pipeline uh, programs kind of throughout this continuum uh, of work and we've partnered obviously with the school of medicine in doing so and many of our current medical students will be mentors and serve as mentors and certainly role models and go out and speak to these high school students, especially when they come from those communities. It's, you can see it, then you can more readily be it. And we really want to, um, to, the, to, the, to the extent that the students wanna engage in those ways, we really support them in, in reaching out back to communities where they um, come from. So I think that is very important. I, I agree totally with what Renee is saying. Um, I, just a couple of other things that I would add. Um, first off, I think um, I think um, I've been very inspired by the the um, reading program where they you know or talk talking is teaching um, program at, at Benny F Children's Hospital in Oakland where they have the big billboards that say like you know talk to your kid at the um, at the stoplight like look at that pretty blue bird, car over there um, and and um, I think we really, first off, I think we have to start super early. Um, like every pediatrician should say to every kid that they see, like, do you want to be a doctor someday? Do you want to be a nurse someday? You know, this is what you do. Isn't this cool? Listen to your heart. You know, look at these breathing medications, this breathing spirometer for your asthma. I mean, we we can do these things. You, it, That's often what it takes. Um, it's just someone to say, you can do this and it's a cool thing to do. I think so that's one thing. Um, I think that the other um, the other thing that I think would be really important is we need to start this outreach, not only pipeline programs, but you know, I hate to say it, but athletic recruiters are all, all over kids in middle school, right? They're looking for these great kids in middle school. Like we need to take some lessons from people who are, you know, seizing talent and sort of saying, hey, you know, you know, follow me and I can get you into acts. We should say like, you know, you know what? 
we heard you were a super good student and we want you to think about coming to UCSF. So um, I think that um, the other thing I would say is just like we talked about sort of um, healthcare deserts, there are pipeline deserts. There are some schools who have a lot of pipeline interest and some of them are already very privileged schools. I think we really need to start thinking about engineering this more consistently um, using our partners at the University of California at other schools to sort of blanket the state at the very least um, with programs that, you know, basically make this a reality for students um, who might not have had the opportunity to think about themselves in this type of a career. I think that's so true. I think there's been a new program starting the California Medical Scholars Program that will be looking at from from junior colleges into the medical schools and how we'll work with them to really facilitate just showing people the way and giving them uh, mentors and the support that they need to navigate the road because often they're first generation as well and don't understand or have somebody who can lay that pathway out to them so uh, i certainly agree with that um, there is a question here that talks about financial aid you discussed financial aid and the increased scholarship support how it positively made an impact on recruitment. As someone who manages a federally funded program that recruits individuals to serve the community at various community-based clinics in San Francisco, we've been looking at recruitment strategies to diversify our cohorts, but run into an issue about funding uh, because members receive a stipend. How would you navigate programs that are under underfunded when we are actively trying to recruit people from the San Francisco community, including BIPOC, LGBTQI+, plus, QIA+, plus, et cetera. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, money does talk. And one, one of the interesting things we're seeing is um, right now, I think many medical schools across the country are sort of um, beginning to realize how important diversity is. And so um, good for them. There are many students who come from backgrounds that have been historically excluded or underrepresented who are now receiving very many competitive um, scholarship packages. So it is um, it's a little bit, um, it's great, it's great news if you're one of those students. Um, but one of the challenges is that um, now those students may in fact be graduating with almost no debt. Um, and so may not be susceptible to things like loan repayment. Um, so I think we're gonna have to think a little bit more about this. I would hope, I would hope um, that, for example, this is an area where private-public partnerships, um, I know Renee and Wiley have been working on, and um, Monica McElroy have been working on the anchor, anchor institution work. Um, I wonder if we shouldn't really just sort of think to ourselves about, it, you know, maybe there is just a salary support strategy that we should be thinking that basically you don't, as a, as a private as a practitioner, could choose to make a purpose-driven decision that was not economically disadvantageous to you. Um, but, um, you know, either that we either got the state to do it, we've got to get the state to do it, or we've got to get um, private institutions or philanthropy to do it. But I think we have to create a compelling story and move from there. Yeah, I think we have to tell the story. It becomes what are the priorities? Often it's not the, it's not the money, it's where the money's going. And how do we, we tell the story such that this gets prioritized? in a way to meet the needs of those, those communities that uh, really have the greatest need. Well, this has been just an outstanding uh, conversation with you, an outstanding presentation. I'm glad your, your puppy's in the room. Uh, we heard her in the address, um, but UCSF under your leadership in the medical education is really leading the country, I think quite honestly, in, in exploring this work and also recognizing the challenges that we don't have all the solutions. So um, I just applaud that you're uh, continuing to move this forward for us and continuing to move it forward for academic medicine because this is exactly what's necessary to get the doctors of the future that we need. Well, thank you for your leadership too, Renee. Um, we couldn't do it without you and, and Alejandra as well. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to be a, a part, participant in this really exciting series. Thank you so much. All right.